got our projector working again. I have a lot of pressure there because Deborah needs to practice. And BBS is coming. And I know, Pam. <laughs> I know, Pam. Yes, Pam. Yes, Pam. Anyway, tonight I want to talk to you about to God be the glory. Have you really ever thought about why we give God praise? There's a lot of reasons for it. He deserves it. Oh, yeah, he's our creator and sustainer. And, uh, oh, yeah, our entire uh, creator of our packaging we call life. Our packaging. Packaging. You've got to be careful with that one. Oh, no, no. That, that's a good one. <laughs> this, this dirt, all by its own volition, has no tendency to uh, want to move, live, and God created the package and brought all that dirt together to make it live. <laughs> yes, he did. Any other reasons out there tonight? Wait up. Wait up. <clears throat> Anybody else? Don't raise your arm, I'll call on you. What? I said, don't raise your arm, I'll call on you. What did you say, Betty? He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. To God be the glory. Thankful. But you know, the one thing I really think about when I think about why do we glorify God? Because it keeps us where we're supposed to be. Right? Huh? Keeps us sane, but it keeps us humble, right? See, part of the arrogance, as I mentioned this morning, part of the issue that we have in our world today, and we've always had in our world today because man's always been there, is our arrogance and sometimes our ignorance that's caused by that arrogance, correct? That's right. Sometimes we get, not sometimes, quite often, what is what we're witnessing right now, we get much higher in our perception of who we are than our God, right? When you think about that song we sung earlier, not to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So he loved the world that he gave us his own son who yielded his life an atonement of sin and opened the life gate that we all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Amen. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender. I always love that one, the vilest offender. You know, God doesn't really save perfect people. Do you notice that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Right. He dug some of us out of some pretty nasty spots, didn't he? Yep. Hmm? Sodom was burning when we were there, right? We were there. Yeah, it got away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, luckily, the vilest offender who truly believes that the moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Great things he hath taught us, the great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder and transport. Isn't that wonderful? Our transport. Going home, Jim, going home. You'll have to have the extra stalls, you know, Jim. Get his head on the top, right? Put that little sign there, bump your head when you go through. Our transport. Oh, praise when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. John, you'll love this. That was written by Fanny Crosby in 1875. You may already know that. That was a Fanny Crosby. She wrote quite a few stories. But the very reason that this song was written by her was to do exactly what I just said, was to displace us, to remind us to get off of our pedestals and understand where we fit in the overall picture, as Bernie was referring to in the universe, what our packaging was really intended to be, humbled and worshiping God. That's what it was written for, and that's what it was to remind us of. So that because in our natural selves, we want to seek oftentimes, we like to put ourselves up a little higher than what we are, aren't we? It's easy to get there, isn't it, right? Hmm? It is. It is. It's all easy for all of us to, to get a little higher than we should be. But you ever been there? No. No. Never been there. I'm the only one that sometimes gets the big We used to call that the big head. Does anybody ever get the big head? Hmm? I know through life and our physical aspects, we sometimes get the big head, right? But do we ever get the big head in our spiritual lives? Oh, yeah. Hmm? 
Ever get to thinking, of, have you ever made that list of all the things I'm doing? <laughs> Pam came with me to that deal. You may have too much to do already. I do, Pam, but you know the thing is, I only got so much time left, so we got to stay busy, right? Because why? It's the privilege that we get to share the word of God with other people. Do you see it that way? Because honestly, that's the way we should see it, the opportunity that we get, right? I gave my life 50 years doing what I wanted to, huh? Anybody else in here give him 25, get 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 or 50 or 55 years? And then sometimes you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. Have you thought about how many years he gave you to do what you wanted to do? Yeah, he gave me 50. And then he blessed me by not destroying me, but saving me. Why? Because he loves me so much that after 50 years of no, 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 this is all about me, God. He said, I'm going to give you grace and forgiveness and allow you the opportunity to tell other people through your witness, through your witness, who I am. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, when we praise God, it's more than just words. It's not just words. We sing it. And, and as I told you before, you get around those folks that, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, everything is perfect. Be careful. It's not. In God it is, but in our world it's not. But praising God is more than just a celebratory statement. Many people come to church on Sundays to sing and to celebrate their 30 minutes window of praise God. But then as soon as it's over, it fades away, doesn't it? I'm not being critical, I'm being factual. Because we think that singing or shouting or praising the word, hallelujah, praise God, we have, and we have, we have worshipped him. But the reality is our testimony should show praise God in everything I do. How is that? Could be in my worst time, right? Could be the night that Barb and I prayed that tonight will never be the same because you're going into brain surgery in the morning. You're going to have a surgery. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We know it's going to be different. But in that praise God. God, we're going to hold in him. No matter the storm, we're going to hold in him. No matter what came from that, we're going to hold in him. Totally rearrange our life? Yes. And as she tells me now, you can't do anything unless you're in, you're, unless you're in walk in tune with God. Because my health can't stand your rebellion. See, she, it's her belief that her situation was a catapult, a, a driver to get our lives back on track. I don't know, but I know it got our lives back on track. I know it made our yes get a lot stronger and our commitment get a lot stronger, right? Sometimes he encourages us along the way, does he not? Mm -hmm. But you see, in our weakest moment, in our weakest moment is when we praise the loudest. Why? Because when people look, Deborah, and they see you're driving the nice car and you're living in the big house and you got all the money, what is there not to have disparity about, right? Everything's wonderful. But in the beauty of it all, when you are at the bottom, when you are broken, when life is coming at you faster than you know how to handle it, that is when you praise God the loudest without, as Keith Whitley once wrote, without saying a word. Why? Because in him I will stand. In him I know I will stand. In him, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I know he is my transport. He is everything that I need in this life to go to the next one. I am just waiting my time. That is how I praise God. I praise God when I show the world around me my witness. My witness, no matter what that is. But oftentimes it doesn't require words, praise God, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus, it's all good. Beautiful songs, big actions, but the bottom line is I praise God to remind myself of where I'm supposed to be at the feet of the cross, at the feet of Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful concept, servant of it all? Look with me tonight in Genesis, Genesis 14. We've been there for a while. A lot of, so many wonderful scriptures and stories. So many different, like I said this morning, so many places to go and take different direction. So many places to lose my glasses. Look, I found them. Ta-da! 1422. 
14.22. I want to talk to you a little bit about Abraham tonight. 14, 20, Genesis 14, verse 22. And it says, But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, With a raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing. Our Father, thank you for these words tonight. Just just uh, in, uh, be with us, God. Lead us and direct us. Open our hearts, God, that we can hear for every, all of us in our different ways what we need from your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As I said, when do we worship? When do we praise God? Why do we praise God? There are many reasons. Y'all listed many great reasons of why we praise God. But the bottom one is to keep us in place of who we are in our humility, to keep us humble, Butch. Butch came home this week and found out he didn't live where he lived anymore. That's humbling, isn't it, Butch? <laughs> Life has a way of just sneaking up on you, don't it? Take a vacation and come home and they moved his house. That's the only negative with an RV, isn't it? They can hook up and move it. That's why I think in these textures you're supposed to take the wheels off, Butch. You gotta pay taxes that way. <laughs> All you gotta do is go find it now, right? Yeah. I just slide in one of them down there. But this this is the thing we see in Abraham. We know in Abraham, as we talked about this morning in chapter twelve as well as fourteen, we know that Abraham had made a commitment to God, right? He made a commitment to God. He believed in God. He had faith in God. Just as much as, he had just as much faith in God as Lot had in himself, right? Remember what Lot said this morning? I'll choose. I'll choose. Abraham did the same thing, right? What did he say? I'll choose. I'll choose God. I will choose God. This actual passage of scripture is after the four kings had taught, uh, attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham had gone and rescued a Lot. Right? He went and got him, brought him back, brought back all the stuff, got all the stuff back, came back and said, okay, here you go. You're free again, Lot. And the kings of Sodom came to him and said, what? We want to honor you. We want to give you, we want to pay, pay, uh, pay, pay, pay patronage to you. We want to honor you, lift you up. And what did Abraham say? Uh, Nay, I don't need anything from you. Why? Because my God, my God, my God, you know, that's the same God as I keep telling y'all every day, every, every time we get together. That's the same God is your God. Capiche, understand? It's the same God that Abraham is your God, my God. Why do we praise? Because he's an awesome God. He's a wonderful God. God bless you. What a strong set of words, right? God bless you. How many times do you think that gets used just lightly? Huh? God bless you. Oh, God bless you. How many people sneeze, right? Hmm? God bless you. Not to be trying to be sync religious, but think of the power that's in those words. God bless you. Blessings to God. Praise him. Praise him. That's what we're talking about. Genesis, in, in Genesis, Abraham was a, a powerhouse, a conviction of God. If we go back to verse 12 it says, so Abraham, excuse me, chapter 12 verse 4 said, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him and Abraham was 70 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. You know what he said to him? You know what he's saying there? He said, you go, right? Abraham said, I will. Which means what? The faith that he had in God, amen? That's what he had. You go, I'm going to send you away from where you are, your family. I'm going to send you into a new land. You go. I'm going to bless you as a nation. You go. You go. And he said what? Yes. Yes. I know at Lake Fork one time, and this is really where we got into this, our pastor had a drive uh, for a while, a series of sermons on just say yes. Fortunately, or unfortunately for y'all, Barbara and I stumbled down front and said yes. Right? And right at that moment, we didn't know what that really meant totally, right? We do now. And that's why I would say to you tonight, if you think that you have a place to be for God, don't be afraid of the fact that it may not develop just like that. Sometimes we want that instant train, that instant uh, return on investment, right? I said yes, now what, God? We went home, laid down, looked at the ceiling. What's going to happen? 
Got up the next day, wonder what's going to happen. Got on the next Wednesday, what's going to happen? We kept trying different things. Maybe we need to teach this class. Maybe we need to do this. Maybe we need to do that. We kept, you hear that? We kept trying different things, trying to find where we fit, right? Until God decided this is where you're going to be. Huh? Yeah. See, the question was, though, yes or no, I will or I won't. Right? Because at any point, any point I could have said what? Oh, no, I don't think so. Sell my house? I just bought this house. Why would I sell my house? For those people? Really? I don't even like those people. I don't even know them. Right? But see, the commitment was to heal them. Right? That's what Abraham's saying right here. He loved Lot. He went and saved his nephew. He went and got their stuff. He went and brought it back. He was going to be honored. He was going to be celebrated. But why did he go in the first place? Because of his commitment to his God. That's what it says right there. I raised my hand. I made a commitment to my God. That's why you don't get distracted with things around you. That's why when things aren't going just exactly the way we want to, and there seems to be holes in the front line, and we need help here, and we need help there, if you are committed to your God, you keep on going. Why? Because the commitment is between you and God. Right? I'm going to go help Lot. We know how the story went. We talked about it this morning. We got into it last Sunday night some. Lot's choice. Lot's life choice kept infecting and bothering everybody else, didn't it? Hmm? And wasn't it a shame? And wasn't it a shame because if you look at, let me see it right quick. Uh, Genesis 13. If you're over in Genesis 13, 5 and 6. It said, Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. What happened when... Lot slid into Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to all of his possessions when the four kings came? Right. You see that? You see, Lot had all this stuff that he accumulated by being with people of God, of being around Abraham, being in the same faith of Abraham. But as he slid into Sodom, what happened? <laughs> took his family, <coughs> took all of his possessions, took everything he worked for, you hear how Satan works in the world? Huh? See it every day. It's every day. Every day. Every day. The further that we drift from God, the closer that we drift into the world, and then suddenly you are now a captive. Huh? You're now a captive. Do you love the metaphors? Or is it just me? Do you see it in the story? Lot slid into Sodom. All of his possessions, all of his wealth. He was a wealthy man. Was. Was. And then suddenly he woke up one day as a captive. But here's the really interesting part. He was a captive to the kings, right? <laughs> All of his possessions had been taken. But his real captive problem was that it was in his decision, right? He became a captive <clears throat> because of the decision that he made. Not because necessarily, like I said this morning, was where he lived in a bad spot? But what really put him there? Choice. 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 You see, had he made a different choice, what would have been different? God would have never let him go there, would he, Terry? God won't let you go there. God won't let you go there. Why? Because he's promised to save you, to, to bless you. Hmm? Just like Abraham. He said, you make a commitment in me and I make a commitment in you. To every one of you, every day, your commitment grows stronger and stronger in God every day. It should be, right? Every step, I'm going to get stronger. Every step, I'm going to make a stronger commitment to my walk with God. Not walk with Him, not walk with Lake of Pines Baptist Church, not walk to uh, Brother Swagger. I don't know where that came from. Woo, that's out of the blue. I was thinking of TV evangelist, right? I, Joel Osteen. But no. Your relationship with God. Your relationship with God. That's the beautiful part. Lot was held captive by his decision. Oftentimes in life, we're held captive by our decision, right? 
It's the initial decision that God is there, right? We see the results, and then we have this, this pitiful thing that happens, right? We just don't understand this is what happened. I, this happened, and that happened, and that happened, and this happened, and that happened. But here's the thing. If you never make the decision to go there, you really can't become the captive, can you? Hmm? If you never turn your back on God, if you never put his word down, if you never stop praying, if you never stop trying, if you never stop believing, if you never stop raising your hand saying, I love you, God, I love you, God, I love you, God, he is not going to turn his back on you. He doesn't leave you. He stays with you. And that is the power of God and the grace and mercy. Amen. And thank God for the grace and mercy, no doubt. Let me see if I can find this. Does that seem too complicated? Could it be that simple? My choice has impact to my life. Could it be that simple? So if I go back to Genesis 13, 11, it says, So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards Eden. He began to drift towards Sodom. Let me rewrite this. Listen to this. What if it had said this? So Lot prayed to God... And asked God what he should do with the strife that had risen between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. What if Genesis 13, 11 had said that? Hmm? What? Well, let's think about that. If we're going to talk a double take, a reverse order here, let's think about that. Lot said, I'll choose for myself. And we know this morning how that story ended, right? But had he said, let me pray to God as Abraham did, let me follow God, let me seek God, and then stand still and wait for his answer, how would it have changed his life? How would it have changed the story? Well, as first of all, Moab would not exist, correct? Hmm? Because Moab could not exist if Lot's daughters had not committed sin. Lot's wife would still be alive. Lot's home and possessions would still be intact, right? Lot's other children and family would not have been lost and destroyed in Sodom. Abraham does not have to risk his life and his property to go save Lot. God would have been praised. All glory to God. All over what? I will choose for myself or I will pray and ask God. That is the essence of prayer. We sometimes make that word bigger than it is. It's a big word, but sometimes we make it bigger, right? We say, I pray. It's some special thing that I have to do. And what did he say? No, don't make it something special. Get in your closet and talk to me. Don't put your arms up and talk about, oh, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Don't praise me in public and tell me how great I am and then turn from me in private. He said, get in your closet, get on your knees, and tell me, Brother Tony, what it is that you need. Right? Yeah. It would change our world imperatively. It would have changed Lot's life. It would have changed the history of the Bible, would it not? This whole story, everything that went on would have been changed all in one decision. I'm going to ask God, Revis. Instead of choosing for myself. Yet I wonder tonight in our independence. How many people here? Don't raise your hand. But how many people would say privately that you have made decisions based on your own opinion at some time or not in your life? I'm talking about serious decisions like who you were going to marry, right? Where you're going to go to work. Where you're going to live. Huh? Big decisions. Am I going to have children? Am I not going to have children? Right? I know I'm the only one there, too. Not the children part. I didn't choose to have to. I mean, I can't have. Well, anyway. But you know what I'm saying? Have you ever got up and said, I'm going to go do this, right? I'm going to go buy this. I'm, gonna, I'm going here. I'm going to remember what the partner said. I'm going to do such and such. What should we say? If God wills. Oh, had Lot said that. If God wills. Look at the, what transpired in his family. Look at the destruction, the loss that transpired in his family, all because he didn't take the time to say what? In God, I trust. God, what would you have me do? Oh, what power. What that, and that's the thing. What power every one of you have in that relationship with your God. It's not just words. It's truly that situation. Not trapped in our circumstances. I know some of us have made those decisions. We have. Poor Lot. Poor Lot. You know, that was the other thing. Lot just didn't have any examples to go by, did he? 
Mm -hmm. Right? We don't have any examples in our world to go by, do we? There's just no place to have a good example anymore, is there? Just can't find a good example of good people trying to live a good life, Lord. You know that? I just can't. I searched every channel on the television couldn't find one. Got back to Jimmy Swaggart again. Oh. Bless his heart. I shouldn't pick on you, Brother Jimmy. We just can't find a good example. Yet where was Abraham? Right there. Right there. Lot well, said, poor me, I can't find, I can't catch a break, can I? Look at all this stuff that's <coughs> happened to me. Can you imagine? i got to leave all my stuff, all my possessions. You know, that was what the struggle was that morning when the angel showed up, right? What do you think he was still standing there for? There's my Harley and my boat. My, oh, my boat. I forgot about my boat. There's my ranger. You, really? My fishing tackle, my work, my, all my stuff. Butch my trailer if you can find it. <laughs> all those things that I have. Oh, you want me to leave those? All the things of my life that I've worked for. You want me to step out on blind faith that God is going to destroy this and I need to get out? Do you Remember this morning? This is the real conversation. Do you think his mind worked any differently than ours did? No. You want me to what? And please forgive me, ladies. But at some point, she's like, we just built this house. <laughs> Those are my dishes in there. I'm not leaving that. Those are my, how about this? Those are my kids. Huh? I'm telling you, folks, there's some folks that are going to allow their children to pull them down. I hate to say it. I'm talking about their grown children. They're too attached. We've got some families in our world today. Now I'm meddling and I'm preaching again. I'm absolutely meddling, though. We've got some that are allowing their children to drive the horse. Children don't need to be driving families. They're not old enough. Sorry, guys, for the young ones in here tonight. There's a time and a place that you become an adult, but at 8 and 9 and 10, you shouldn't be driving the family. Amen. Boy, this is one that Satan has sold this world. Look, high, uh, line, hook, and sinker. Or hook, line, and sinker. Is that the way it goes? Hook, line, and sinker. Right? And I'm telling you, I'm talking to more and more young Christian couples that are telling me, well, you know, it's just this weekend. Right? Have are you all not noticing? Hmm? The fishing tournaments now for the teenagers for the high school is on Saturday and Sunday. Baseball is now on Sunday. I'm just telling you folks, and I'm talking to young people in their 20s and 30s that are saying, what do you think? I'm thinking you're leading your family away from God. It's not an accident. Satan is saying, come on. I just need one Sunday. What happened to Wednesday nights? Hmm? Oh, we're just a PTA meeting. They still have PTA? I don't guess we do. Do they? Right? Oh, it's just, it's just one gathering. You're just going to miss one Wednesday night. I'm telling you, he's working on Sunday right now, folks. Big time working on Sunday. Hmm? It should break your hearts when you look outside on Sunday morning to see how many people aren't even going, to, aren't even acting like they're going to church, right? We need some good old fakers again in America to make it at least look good, right? <clears throat> Don't be discouraged. Have your faith in God. Just understand what we're dealing with, right? The lead there. Double take. God could have said that. Abraham could have said the same thing to God, couldn't he? Hmm? Abraham in, in 12, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. The greatest of all. And Abraham could have said what? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm going to stay here. Huh? See how they correlate back and forth again, story after story after story. Orpa and Ruth. I'm going to stay right here with the Mobiles. I'm going to stay in Mobile. I'm going home. Ruth said, I'm going here. Abraham said, I'm going with you, God. Lot said, no, I'm not. See the pattern where people, he's giving you example after example after example of the right way to live your life and the wrong way to live your life. It is not that complicated. I don't even care if you read Matthew 1 where you get into all the lineage and the genealogy and all the begotten gets in there. I know that still sounds confusing, but in the ultimate end of it all, it's still not that complicated. It's based on my choice to choose how I want to live my life. And in the grace of God, that's what he gave us. No matter how much he paid, how much he ransomed his life for hours, he still gave us that freedom of choice. You can't beat it, but you sure can lose it. <laughs> Abraham could have said the same thing. 
And I was thinking about that. What if Abraham did? Then Isaac would have never been born to Abraham. You see, here's the thing we need to understand. Here's the beauty of it. Satan is not going to mess up God's plan. He's interfered with it, has he not? And here's another one. Here's another one that might really shock some people. We're not going to mess it up either. No matter how hard we try, no matter how hard, which is what's going on right now, get past the politics, folks. This is a battle between good and evil, God and Satan going on in America today right now. Get past the politics. Hide it behind a Democrat. Put it up on a Republican. Find you a liberal. But the bottom line is Satan is trying to take God out of this nation. Why? It's the only one remaining that still says God anything. Understand what's going on. Don't be blind. Don't walk down the street and go, duh. Have power in knowing who you are and what's going on. We're in a battle. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I am filled with God because I know he's real. And guess what? Doesn't matter who's in the White House. They're not going to mess up God's plan. Amen. Abraham could have said, no, I'm not going to. And we might read a different lineage when we read Matthew 1. But Isaac may have not been born to Abraham. Jacob may have not been born to Isaac. And as far as we know, Jesus may have not been born to the lineage of King David at that point, right? But here's the thing that's going to happen. Here's the thing that would have happened. He still would have been born. Why? Because God has a plan. Hmm? God is in control. No matter how hard we have tried to mess this up, and have we messed it up? Garden of Eden, think about it. Perfect. <clears throat> Have we messed it up? Oh, my. America, formed in the freedom of God we trust, 200 years later, look. Have we messed it up? Just like I said this morning, the problem is we want our freedom, but we want to forget that it was based in God. I want everything that I want. What? I will choose Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Stories are the same. I'm choosing my pleasures. I'm choosing my pleasures. Just like Lot did. Amen? Amen. Choice. Choice. The funny part was, had Jesus Christ never been born, wow, what about that? Death never defeated? Hmm? Promise never provided? And we would never make it to heaven. Right? But we know one thing. God is in control. He would have found another way, right? Just like with Ruth. I'm going to find another way. I'm going to take a lady. I'm going to take a lady that was raised in a nation, lawless and lost. We haven't even got to that part of Ruth yet. I may be in there for years talking about Ruth. We haven't even got to that part yet. How Ruth went on to do what? Huh? The blessing that she became. The lineage to Jesus Christ himself. We can't mess it up. Why? Because God is in control. He won't let you mess it up. Well, God already wrote the story. Of, well, already wrote the history. We're just living it out for it. You think so? I believe that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, the predictive prophecy in the Bible uh, is profound in the idea that regardless of man's frenzy and attempts to uh, thwart God's uh, divine plan is uh, just shows that God is in control always. He is always in control been, always. And knows always. I but mean, in the predictive prophecy, my only goal, though, is that I still believe that we can change. I still hold on to that prayer. I still hold on to that. That's my hope. That we as a people will change. That we as a people will come back to God. You would agree with me on that, right? Well, yeah. and, and there are people that will be saved. I hope so. Because that's what we're doing here. Uh, unfortunately, the way the, I read the rest of the book, it says not all. Not all. Not all. Not all. Let me take you someplace else right quick. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 said, For it was God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, 
who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Psalms 104.1. Oh, 104 <laughs> I thought I was a radio disc jockey there for a minute. Psalms 104.1. Psalms 104.1 said, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord, my God, you are so very great. We do praise God for his worthy, but more importantly, we praise God to remind ourselves of who we are. I'm going to tell you that again and again to keep us humble. We praise him. We do recognize him for all these different things. Psalms 123, I lift up my eyes to you to, who sat enthroned in heaven as eyes of slaves to, to look to the hand of their master as the eyes of a female slave look to the hands of her mistress. So our eyes look to our Lord of our God till he shows us mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant or contempt from the proud. Praising God, his mercy on us, O Lord. Psalms 118. I need to flip there right quick. 118, 28. 28. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord forever, for his mercy endures forever and ever. This is your God, your personal God, your personal relationship within God. Praising God displaces us, reminding us not to get too tall, not to get too far out of bounds. I was thinking about that in our church. We need to come together, as we do quite often, and pray, God, what is your direction for us? Right? As Pam yelled at me today on the way out the door, I can get a computer. I don't need a committee right now. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> and to the word committee, we need committees. We need things. We need to make things happen. But at the same time, every time we come together, we need to be prayerful in our hearts as a group of people. God, what is it that we need to do? God, where do we need to go? God, where are you leading us? It's always at the core of everything we do. We should be in constant prayer conversation. That's what that is. Prayer and conversation with him saying, God, what will you have us do? How will we be a witness? What is this mixture that's come together, this, this grouping of people? How do we shine brighter in our community? How do we praise, show our praise beyond just words? beyond millers and, and, and parties and, and food. How do we truly show people that we are of God? It has to become part of our lives. It has to become part of who we are. It has to become part of our DNA. Either one could have chosen. Psalms 118 said, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever and ever and ever. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. What if Lot would have sang those words to him? How would that have changed? To many of us in here, had we so chose those words how many earlier, how much time earlier in our lives? I don't know. But I do know one thing. Once that you have accepted him, he has a place for you to be. He has a job for you to do. He has a yes ministry for you. The question is, what is it? Find it. Hang on to it. Be committed to it. No matter what you think it is. If you think it's of God, be committed to it. Be committed to him. It's your blessings. It's your blessings. To God be the glory great things he hath done. We, why do we praise God? Why do we praise God? For the same reason that that lady wrote that song. To keep me humble. To never let me get above my raising, as Ricky Skaggs says once. Don't get above your raising. To stay humble before your God. Why praise God? Because it places credit where credit is absolutely due. Hmm? Praise God at the feet of a gracious and loving and forgiving God. I said this morning, often the questions and the answers have gotten lost in America today and the world today, right? We still think this world is, is all about us. That's, that's part of the lost, right? We really do think it's all about us. And in the fact, we forget this very part that God is in control. 
it is really all about God. It really is. It's going to level at some point. It's all going to come to level at some point. But right now, man still thinks that this whole thing is spinning because of him. And it's not. Praise God. Praise God. Genesis 14, 22 through 24, Abraham said, With a raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God, most high creator of heaven and earth. With a raised hand tonight, I beg of you to make that commitment to your God. Right? My God, your God, understand the power of the relationship that you have with him, the beauty of that, the awesomeness of that, if I could use that word, the awesomeness of that. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time and attendance tonight. It's good to see you. Some new folks in the crowd this morning. Z was here this morning, hadn't seen her in a long time. I hadn't really had so it's good to see her uh, anything in closing tonight thanks for helping me with the song service today young man appreciate it remember when you leave remember tomorrow morning remember after all the remember you're no longer a slave to fear hmm? I'm no longer a slave to this world you are a child of God Amen. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful thought. Every time you feel it breaking down, realize those words. Pull yourself back up. Pick yourself back up. Call a friend. What was that show? What was that? Yeah. Call a friend, right? Huh? Or be like Brendan. Just show up at their house and make them go someplace with you, right? Get them out. Dig them out of there. I promise you there's a lot of people sitting in houses tonight that think it's all over with folks. They are so isolated, so depressed. I'm, I promise you. They go to the store, they're so afraid. They go to the store, they go home, they go to the store, they go home. They think this is it. They think this is it. They don't even realize the love and the joy and the power of God that's still out there. And that's what we have to show. The light has to stay on and the steeple has to stay burning until the last soul is saved. Amen? Amen. The power of God. Mm. Brother John, would you dismiss us in prayer tonight, please, sir? Lord, we do thank you so much.